What is up, everybody, and welcome into the Keeping It 1000 Podcast Legends Series here, presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app. I'm your host, Adam Mares, and I'm joined by my co-host, George Carl, as we are going to go back to the 90s. Coach Carl, how are you doing? I'm good. You know, basketball's back, and uh, a lot of blowouts, and a lot of weird <laughs> games, and a lot of bad teams, and a lot of good teams, so we're all into that state of... What the hell is going on in the NBA, but nobody really knows. Well, this is what I love is I would classify the last week as excitement, joy, energy. The NBA's back. Basketball's back. Um, but this is why I like it. You're, you're annoyed with the blowouts and the sort of the, the preseason extended play that we always get the first year of the season. But uh... <laughs> you know, we don't have a preseason. It just started two days ago. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it, it's a little sloppy so far, but it's fun. But we're not going to talk about the first week of the season. We'll get to that next week when we return to the regular Keep It at 1000 podcast. Today, George Carl wore his Sonics hat, as he usually does, because we are going back to the 90s. We're going to talk a little bit about George Carl's Sonics, but we're going to talk a lot about the 1990s Nuggets, and in particular, 92 through 98, featuring one of the all-time fan favorites in Denver Nuggets history, certainly one of my favorites when I was growing up, uh, coming up in the 90s, first watching the 90s, uh, watching the NBA and watching the Nuggets. And that is, of course, our guest today, LaFonso Ellis. Everybody welcome LaFonso Ellis in. Fonz, it's great to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you all. Thank you guys for having me today. Lafonso, I, I need a pair of glasses like that. Where'd you get them? I like them. I gotta get some like that. I sent you a pair, Doc. <laughs> So, Fonz, are you? Uh, we know you obviously analyze the game of basketball, especially at the college level. But this first week of the NBA, have you been tuned in? Have you been watching some of the NBA? And if so, what's caught your eye? Yeah, I haven't been able to watch as much as I would like to. Uh, we kick off our season on November 9th. And so we've started this national podca podcast as well. So those two things have kept me pretty busy. But I heard Coach Call talk about the number of blowouts that have been taking place so early. And I wonder how much of that is – not having a real preseason to mm. prepare and get ready. So uh, hopefully and they, that and they curve don't have two days quickly. anymore. What's that, Coach? And they don't have two days anymore. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> that's actually a good question. I could start with that one. I want to know, because George talks about this all the time, about all the rest and, and everything that is built into the practice schedule and this or that. When you were coming through in the 90s, and, and, and especially early on with Dan Issel, was it two-a-days? Were you guys practicing – a lot or what was the practice schedule like in those days yeah my rookie year we had 14 days of training camp uh two days as coach was referring to around that seventh day uh we only went one just to kind of allow for some rest and recovery and uh, uh. i actually it was hard but i preferred it that way because i felt that by the time my first game came around especially that first regular season game i felt uh, I felt physically ready to take that on because of the challenge that we'd had for two weeks. And during that time, Coach Carl, as you know, we played uh, on average of about eight preseason games. And uh, many coaches, of course, would try to not play their, particularly their starters as much during the preseason. But I used to get upset with Dan when he used to pull me because I wanted to play more 30, 35 minutes so I can have eight games to get ready for the regular season, which would help me get off to a quicker start once we started the regular season. It's funny because George talks about loving an extended preseason. You talk about it. Nowadays, the coaches, they don't want any preseason, it sounds like. They want one game. Players want even less than that. It's funny how that, that's a different, mind, different mindset. Um, let's get started, though. This is going to be, as if you're new to this program, I, we're telling the history of the Denver Nuggets. 55, 56 years now in the NBA. Uh and we're trying to tell the story from the eyes of the people that actually played it. And Fonz, we're going back to 1992. And we're actually going back before that. I like to get a sense of who you were idolizing as a kid. Before you made the NBA, even before college, you're growing up. Who were some of the players you looked to and wanted to either mold your game after or you were idolizing? Yeah, not necessarily to mold my game after. But I loved guys like Dr. J, Julius Irvin. He had this, just this class about him. He... Yeah. Uh, spoke well he was engaging with uh, media uh, and then I had the privilege of meeting him he and Chopper Travellini the great Chopper Travellini were great friends and so my rookie year uh, Doc happened to be in town and with his relationship with Chopper Chopper brought him back in the locker room and I had the great privilege of meeting him and so that elegance that I spoke of earlier 
I uh, got a chance to experience that real time and, and what an ambassador for our game. And, and so it was guys like that. I want to dress like him. I want to speak like him. And then, of course, later on, I had the privilege of having my senior year collegiate coach be John McLeod, uh, coach uh, the New York Knicks and, of course, a uh, long time for the, Phillip, for the Phoenix Suns. And uh, knowing that the game was changing and that it was moving towards more like uh, quicker forwards, um, started looking more at Carl Malone rebound the basketball, really get out in the wing and get on run, trying to get early opportunities in transition. If you couldn't get a layup or a dunk in transition, quick butt hook seal in the lane. And then tr and then the defense, of course, trying to push you out of the lane, but you get an early advantage. The faster you can get there as a big. So uh, those were two of mine. It's funny you mentioned Chopper Travellini because he's like Steve Hess. These characters that were around the Nuggets, of course, uh, as a trainer, but – that were around that had as much personality, if not more than the players. And I don't know how many Nuggets fans, the new version or new age Nuggets fans know Chopper Circle, where Pep, where Ball Arena is located, is named after Chopper Travellini. Coach, do you have any Chopper Travellini stories? I have some X-rated Chopper Travellini stories. <laughs> I don't know if we can go there. I mean, he might have to come out of the grave and come get me. I told all the stories I have on Chopper. Chopper... Well, Doug Moe and Larry Brown, we all went to Russia, Russia together with a USA team in 1973, the year after we lost the Olympics in 72, or got, the Olympics got stolen from us. And we all went to Russia for 21 days. And it was crazy. And, and we, I think we played six games, two in Moscow, two in Kiev, and two in uh, Leningrad. And uh, I just don't want you to know, Chopper is out on the streets trading money in, rubles, money in for rubles. <laughs> he was doing a lot of strange stuff for all of us. <laughs> and 21 days in Russia became like purgatory after about the first 10 days. We thought, when the hell are we going to get out of here? But uh, I had a great time. Chopper's always been big. Uh, there's a bar in town, Adam. I don't know if you know, there's a Chopper's Bar in town here. I actually was at the, I, I was had, I had lunch there a couple days ago. Uh, but Chopper was one of the characters of the ABA that will always be remembered. Yeah, that, that's what it sounds like, a, a true ABA story. And I like that we started with Dr. J as an idol. The Nuggets, obviously an ABA team, and I, I love I, I, it's underappreciated the Nuggets' history in the ABA. I think of them as an ABA team. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the name Nuggets is just such an ABA name. But <laughs> what about rivals coming in? Did you? I read some articles about you and Alonzo Mourning, obviously, you know, coming in at the same time. Were you guys high school rivals? Were you guys seeing each other? I know in different states, but were you guys seeing each other at that level, the college level? And did you have any other rivals as you were getting ready for the NBA? Yeah, no, no, none particularly. It's just that uh, Alonzo and I happened to be McDonald's, McDonald's All-Americans in high school, and we went to the Nike ABCD camps together. And um, through those competitions is where a little bit of a rivalry began. Uh, but then we went on. He obviously went to Georgetown. I went to Notre Dame. And then the – is that my freshman year? Yes, freshman year in the NCAA tournament. So we played against each other in a high school basketball game in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, that a lot of my family and friends and my hometown got a chance to see. We ended up losing that game late by three or six, if I remember correctly. Uh, both of us played well. And then uh, first round of the NCAA tournament when I was in college, uh, we second round, we meet again. And uh, he and I uh, played well there, but a guy named uh, – Charles Smith crushed us <laughs> at 30 points in that game. And uh, yeah, the, the, that's my memory then. Of course, uh, we were both drafted together, had the privilege of playing with them my last two years in Miami. And right. Alonzo is another one of those guys, ultra competitive on the floor, but an absolute gentleman off the floor. And I don't think he gets enough credit for, uh, and he, he, he likes it this way, but he doesn't get enough credit for, many of the philanthropic endeavors that he's had starting his first day uh, in Charlotte when he was drafted in 1992. So uh, we've had a long history together and uh, I was very grateful to have him played against him in high school and college and played with him in the last two years of my career. 
All class. I love it. Your idols are all your idols, your rivals, everybody, all class. It's very fitting. Um, if we go, I want to ask you about being drafted now. You get drafted by the Nuggets. What did you know? You talked a little bit about Chopper, but what did you know in that year? And what were some of your expectations and thoughts when you when you found out you were going to Denver? How was that received by you? During the – so what happens is – and it's during school. So if you go to school like – go to a school like Notre Dame uh, that takes academics seriously, the professors actually weren't going to allow the department – I was an accounting major. And so the chair wasn't actually going to allow me to go out and – work out for wow. uh, several teams because it was spring semester and we're getting close to the end. So uh, Coach John McLeod had to go on my behalf, talk to the department chair and and give me <laughs> a letter that would allow me permission to be able to go and work out. But if I remember correctly, I think I worked out for 13 teams, uh, the Nuggets twice uh, during that time. And one of the two criticisms, I had been academically ineligible twice while pursuing my accounting degree yeah. in college. <laughs> there were two things. So one, there was a character issue there. You know, was he a hard worker, et cetera? And then the other thing was, could I shoot the basketball from the perimeter? Because at Notre Dame, I played with my back to the basket a lot. And so I shot the ball well in Denver the first time around. And after taking a few more trips, they actually pulled me right off the plane, didn't give me an opportunity to go back to the hotel, but maybe go straight to the arena and uh, see if I could replicate that same shooting. And so I happened to shoot the basketball well there too. And so uh, leading into the draft, I, if I remember correctly, I think a week before the draft, I was slated to go late in the first round. Uh, but then as we got closer to the draft, I think the day of, I was supposed to go somewhere between 11 and 19. I thought that if uh, I was still available at the 13th spot, I thought Denver would take a chance on me there. And uh, <laughs> I see my agent kind of moving around while we're sitting at the table as we got near the fifth pick and yeah Denver ended up taking me at number five and uh, that was a great day for me my wife my 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 kids my family and uh, yeah, yeah I was quickly introduced, introduced to the Denver uh, community flew in the next day and um, obviously there were some questions because I think uh, Tom Gugliotta went after me and I think most of the fans would have preferred to have had him and so it was a lukewarm welcome, uh, but I was committed to trying to be who I was, which was a uh, shot blocking, rebounding, back to the basket, get out and run kind of guy. And I felt if I could get on the floor and, and produce well, then um, I think the fans would kind of, the tide would turn and understand why Bernie Be Beckerstaff decided to take me at five versus 13. And so um, that one of the greatest uh, one of the greatest times of my life being drafted to Denver and having the privilege of playing in front of great fans for six years while I was there. It was a great ride. George, do you remember the scouting report on Lafonso at that time? Do you remember what you thought of him coming into the draft? You know, I, I never really got involved with the draft very much. Uh, you know, we in Seattle, we were, you know, we were trying to win a championship. We thought we had a team that could contend. So, uh, once the season was over, I kind of faded into the sunset. And, uh, you know, I have a reputation. I don't want to get, like young players. Right. But the whole thing comes down to is if you're trying to win a championship, young players don't play. Right. I mean, it takes two, three, four years to get into a, a rotation on a team that's going to win 50 games. And in Seattle, we were we, – that was our gig, and and you also drafting lower first round, and yeah. you're more into making trades and maybe moving back and trading your first round for next year's first round because you don't really need a player. And the only only I think we got to talk about North Carolina because I'm a little tired of Notre Dame. <laughs> oh, I mean. I, I'm speaking later today with Vic Lombardi that is from Notre Dame also. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of worn out on Notre Dame, but uh, I, I study North Carolina's team and I, I like them and I root for them and I watch them, but uh, I'm watching so much NBA basketball that uh, yeah. my free time after that, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time on college basketball unless it's a big game. Hey, Coach, by the time I came around to Notre Dame in 88, I don't know when it started, 
But when you were there, was Notre Dame and North Carolina playing annually? Because by the time I got there, we played you guys every year for my four years of my career. How'd you do? Um, I remember playing Notre Dame, I think, twice in my career in the 70s. But I think it probably came a little bit later mm -hmm. uh, where it became an annual thing. And now, yeah. of course, they're in the ACC now. Sure. And uh, uh, I, I mean, I've always had a lot of love and respect for Notre Dame and, and the history of being in sport. In my generation, Notre Dame is – in a lot of ways, it's still, I don't know how they sustained being the king of football. But in my my time, Notre Dame was always one of the top three teams in football. And then they got better in basketball. As it went on, they became, I mean, I think their basketball program is a primetime program in, in college basketball today. Yeah, the rumor was that Coach Phelps <laughs> and Coach Dean Smith uh, didn't necessarily like each other and weren't willing to play each other on each other's home floor. And so we always played my first year. I think we played the, the Meadowlands. And then the last three years, we played at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, I think we played Madison Square Garden. And then we played them. I think we played them in my senior year. We played them in the semifinals like John Shoemate beat us in the semifinals of wow. the NIT. Wow. <laughs> I, I have one win and one loss, I think, against Notre Dame. Nice, nice. And Hubert Davis, who was my draft class, is now the head coach. <laughs> Hubert's going to do a good job. Everybody's he looking is. down, but I think Hubert's some... People don't know, Hubert's a hell of a competitor. Yes, he is. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a super nice guy, quiet, a little bit on the quiet, passive, introverted side, but when he's on the court, he was a killer a little bit. Yes, yes. Well, I want to circle back here. Let's get back to the Nuggets here for a second. So we go to – you just talked to Coach about rookies and young players not building a championship team. Fonz, your rookie season, you feature a team. You're a rookie. Brian Stith is coming in with you. you got Dikembe and Robert Pack, who are one year in. you got Mahmoud, who's just two years in. That was the youngest team in the NBA – what do you remember about coming in and what was sort of the, um, the, the feeling like, the mood like with the team being as young as you, as you guys were that year? Yeah, Dikembe obviously was the centerpiece who they had drafted uh, two years before Brian and I had come in and uh, Mahmoud was already there. And so the move was trying to uh, add young pieces while going out and bringing in some veteran pieces that could help accelerate uh, the, the winning. And if I remember correctly, um, the Nuggets had won 24 games the year before Brian Smith and I had come in, and uh, we won 36 my rookie year. Gave us a chance to get to the playoffs uh, with about seven games remaining. We were battling out with the Clippers, if I remember correctly. But we had a Reggie Williams, obviously was a great player at Georgetown, could shoot it, could play with his back to the basket, could handle it at 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, uh, Scott Hastings, of course, was the backup center right. on that team. Todd Lichty, Mark Macon, Marcus Liberty. Uh, and so Bernie Bickerstaff, just, he's always had a great eye for, for talent. And, uh, and I think that was indicative of the group that he put together uh, by the time the 1992 team came along. And then he went yep. out and got veterans and Tom Hammonds, uh, who was an enforcer uh, inside and could play both the four spot and the five spot. So we were well balanced with being able to play fast, uh, get out in transition and finish. But also, um, we had multiple guys in that starting lineup who could play with their backs to the basket, and we could take advantage of mismatches from the post out. So that's one of the stories to me of this era is, you know, the Nuggets had the Doug Mo 80s, and, and those were coming to an end. There was a little bit of a gap year. 92, Dikembe was already there. Mahmoud was already there. But 1992, they bring in Dan Issel as a head coach, obviously mm -hmm. a Denver Nuggets legend. And to me, it felt like the start of a new era. Yeah. Uh, you know, all these young pieces, and it was such a good young core. If we rewind that season, you start the, the Nuggets start seven and seven. I don't know how well you remember this rookie season. Start seven and seven, it's going well. And then they went on a 14 game losing streak. Hmm. It was, it, those were the growing pains right there. If you cut out that losing streak where the team was clearly kind of getting their footing, I think they finished 29 and 25 after that and really built some momentum. And I'm just curious yeah. if you remember that time. Did you feel like it was a young team kind of coming into their own by the second half of that season? And if you felt maybe some momentum carrying you into what became a very special season the next year? Well, whenever you put those kind of players together, you have to figure out roles, right? And then 
and young players having to figure one, one of the most, in my mind, one of the most difficult things to figure out when you first come to the league as a young player, the defensive schemes, there's so many, <laughs> and right, know where right. you come from. Do you come from a program that was primarily a zone program? Uh, were they a man program? Were they, and even in their man, did they understand ball screen concepts, weak side, right. what you need to, et cetera. And so, uh, yeah, it took us a while to figure that out. Dikembe and I used to fight over rebounds, so we had to figure out our chemistry on the inter- or when someone's driving, is Dikembe going to go make the block? Am I come over and make the block? So we had just a lot of defensive miscues along the way. And then, uh, like any uh, players and all of those players that come from uh, really solid collegiate backgrounds and had high IQ, so we started to figure figure it out, which I thought put us in position to be able to try to slide into the uh, into the playoffs uh, in our first year. But, um, you know, we were fighting it out with the Clippers team that had Mark Jackson as the point guard, and uh, that was a really good talent. Lloyd Vaught as the uh, power forward in the team. Uh, really, really good, talented Clippers team, and we just missed the playoffs in my first year. Was it the second most tenured player was Reggie Williams that year, who was it was only his fifth year in the NBA. He was the <laughs> yeah. second oldest player on the roster, just to give it an example of how mm-hmm. young this team was. And the reason I say so much promise around it, you were named first team all rookie. Um, Mahmoud at the time, Chris Jackson, was named most improved player. Yeah. And of course, Dikembe Matumbo was a rising star, as you mentioned, the centerpiece. So that was a team that if you just looked at it the way people watch the game nowadays, where it's all about the future and what's next. That was a team that I think a lot of people thought, oh, there's a lot of talent here, a lot of young talent on here. Let's see how they gel. And, of course, that ended up being the case, obviously, over the next two seasons. But I want to go back to Dan Issel. What kind of coach was he? And what was kind of your first impressions of him? I mean, he was a rookie coach. Mm -hmm. What what was your impressions of him right out of the the gate? Well, he's a player's coach. Uh, He obviously came in with the plan of how he, Gino, and Mike uh, wanted to – uh, schematically from an offensive and defensive perspective, how we were going to handle things, but he was certainly open uh, to any suggestions that the players would make. And I thought the thing that he's really good at and not surprised by that because he was an, an elite level player, but he was really good at knowing where mismatches were coming into the game. Mm-hmm. And we would exploit those early because we wanted to have the defense on the heels uh, the entire night. So uh Oftentimes, Brian Stith at 6'6", 220, 225 pounds, would have a mismatch at his position as a two guard. We'd throw that thing in the him space out. Hey, Coach Carl, back in the day when we could hang out in the alley up by the 28-foot line. (laughs) Six guys up there. (laughs) Old hands. Yes, yes. And, uh, yeah, and so we, we, we played inside out. And if we can get you to turn that basketball over or take a quick shot, we were trying to get out and get quick baskets. But I, I thought he did a great job of keeping things simple, get a good feel of the flow of the game. Um, if he would feel that uh, maybe I had a, a great example is the fur, if I'm remembering correctly, I think my first game my rookie year was against San Antonio Spurs with David Robinson. And uh, if I remember correctly, it was either a single or a double overtime uh, game. Dikembe fouls out. And so oftentimes when Dikembe would go to the bench, we'd put Tommy Hammonds in at the center position because he was undersized, but he's really strong and leveraged really well. Well, Dan came with this brilliant idea to have me guard David in the overtime. And so I just tried to do my best to stay under him, to make him take contested shots. Uh, we go on and win, and win that game. But that's a great example of Dan. You expect it on the offensive end, but he had a really good feel for what was going on the defensive end as well. And I've always admired his ability to be able to feel what's going on in real time and make adjustments that could put us in position to be able to win. And he certainly did it on the defensive end there in the first game of my first game of my rookie season. Coach, was Dan Issel the type of player? I mean, he was a fiery player. Was he a guy that you thought, oh, he'll be a, a coach someday? Uh, I think at that stage of my life, I, I always, I always had this something in the back of my mind that stars don't make good coaches. Mm-hmm. Someone told me that Jerry West or someone told me that, that stars who the game is easy for doesn't understand the game is hard for most players. Mm-hmm. Right. And so mm-hmm. their ability to communicate the game sometimes gets mixed up a little bit. Uh, but I thought Dan did a good job. I think anytime, you know, a, pl- a great player gets instant respect 
from the players he is coaching. That's a good point. And responsibility and respect are so important in the in coaching in the NBA. Uh, there's always a give and take. You play 82 games, so some somewhere along the season, every player is going to be mad at the coach. <laughs> I mean, it's just not. I mean, you play too many damn games, and so you know, you know, Lafonso makes five jumpers in a row, and I take him out and stay in my rotation. He's pissed off that I took him out of the game. Absolutely. I say it's not about one game, it's 82 games. You know, so, you know, there's always those little things. And so I'd probably say when Dan Issel got the job, I was kind of going, I, I don't know if he's going to be a good or bad coach because of that. Interesting. That's, that bias that I had in my head. He's also a big man. It, it, most coaches that are former players, it seems, are guards, point guards, or, or wings. It's – you know, Kevin McHale, obviously, there's a few exceptions, but it's not too often that you get a big man that becomes a head coach. I always thought that was interesting, especially with you being a big man, Fonz, uh, just, you know, whatever perspective that brought. But let's let's keep this moving. So that first season, as I mentioned, 29 and 25 to close out the year. So on the upswing, uh, that next season, obviously, is the big one, the 1993-94 season. My first question is, you wore the Rainbow Skylines your rookie year. Yes. They, they go to a new logo. They go oh. to a new color scheme. It's new players. Does, <laughs> you're already shaking. Did it feel like a new era? Like, okay, this is the new Nuggets. Or did, were you, did you not like it right out of the gate? I was bummed. I okay. love the Skyline. <laughs> we, 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 could have, we could have had a new era and yet held on to some of the old. And so I, I, if I have one regret it would be that we didn't get a chance to wear newer versions of the Skyline uniform. But Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. But after, after the, to your point, the late push that we had and having an opportunity. So we, 24 games the year before Brian and I were there, 36, clearly uh, momentum is going our way. And so coming into year two, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were spending some time together in the off season. Several guys stayed around that were, Hey, George, how about back in the day when our strength and conditioning coach was also our trainer who taped our ankles? <laughs> who also? See, I mean, now we got 40 people on the court. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. I, don't, I so, couldn't remember all the names of all those people. I was right. coaching them. Yeah. So, so we had a two, so, so coaching staff, head coach, two assistants, a trainer, and we got an assistant trainer, and the trainer was responsible for strength and conditioning during the summer. He did all this Jim Gillen now, the legendary Jim Gillen, did all of the travel and every other thing that you can think of uh, were their responsibility. But uh, that summer, guys stayed around, and we were able to work out together. And so coming to that season in terms of chemistry, I, I thought we had good chemistry. And then throughout the season, um, you know, we had nine out of our 12 guys going to chapel together. Uh, when we would go out on the road, nine to 10 of us were always out to dinner together. And so there was something unique that was happening off the floor that I felt put us in a position to be able to carry onto the floor that would be a huge positive for our entire team. What about the additions of Rodney Rogers and Brian Williams that year? Kind of what did they bring to the team that was that was different? Uh, Rodney Rogers, I mean, six, seven, 255 pounds at the three position yeah. for us, the ability to knock down threes. Uh, one of the first at his size that could change speeds and change direction off the dribble. You can play him with his back to the basket. Uh, so uh, versatile player that you can actually play the three, four and five spot. And then Bison Dele gave us exactly what we needed as a 6'11", uh, two foot jumping hook shot, push shots around the rim that can block shots, rebound that could also run the floor. And so when Dikembe would go off the floor, we didn't lose a lot because Brian, not as good of a shot blocker as Dikembe uh, was obviously, but he could uh, deter and block some shots on his own, but more of a potent score when he got the basketball down in the blocks, uh, willing passer out of double teams. And then what he afforded us the opportunity to do even more so is it allowed us to play big. So right. we have Dikembe at 7-2 at the center spot. Uh, we put Bison Dele <clears throat> at the uh, power forward spot at 6-11. I would often play the three or Rodney would play the three. Right. Uh, it just gave us a lot more versus – actually, now that I think about it, that gave us a huge squad because it was Dikembe at the center spot, Brian Williams at the uh, four. I would right. play the three, and Reggie Williams at 6-7, six, 6-8 six, would play the two. 
Norman. <laughs> with Robert Pack, the speedster, or Mahmoud the shooter at score at the point guard position. So those two guys uh, added tremendous versatility and skill to a very balanced team that we already had. And this is going to come up here in a little bit, Coach, but I feel like that size was a large part of, of – what happened in that series. And we're going to talk about some of the numbers in it here, uh, here in just a second. Um, but the, another thing happened this way. I don't think a lot of Nuggets fans, especially the new generation realized the Nuggets that summer traded for Alvin Robertson. <laughs> and he never played a single game. He was an all-star. He comes to the Nuggets, gets hurt at, with uh, has a back injury yeah. and doesn't play the entire se- season. Was that a, you know, do you remember that being a pretty high profile thing? Hey, this is going to be a major piece. And then it ends up not being a thing. Kind of what was uh, what was it like having a, such a big trade kind of go belly up before it even started? Yeah, we we our mindset had been always when a guy would go down, next man up. And so, okay. you know, second year in the program, that was our mentality. Now, certainly, Alvin Robertson, one of the best one-on-one defenders all time in the history of our game. And just given the experiences that he had had uh, playing winning basketball, we were excited to see – Uh, because you bring guys on your team that way, everyone gets better because he's able to teach you the ins and outs of uh, positioning uh, back then when we can hand check, uh, borrow him. You know, he could, we younger guys could learn so much from him. And though he wasn't able to compete on the floor with us, just having his presence there. And because Dan, again, Dan Issel, uh, Gene and Mike were great at receiving uh, advice from, from players, I'm not sure we would have been able to accomplish what we accomplished without his influence, even not being in uniform. So we were grateful to have him over there on the sideline. All right, coach, let's look a very good regular season for the Nuggets. They get into the eight seed, you know, a young team kind of coming together. The Sonics, obviously the number one seed, pretty dominant regular season uh, team coming together. What was the scouting report coach in your mind on the Nuggets? Can what were you thinking about them heading into that 1-8? And was there any, oh, this might be a, a dangerous young team? Uh, we, we were worried about them because some of our matchups weren't very good. They were bigger than we were. Right. Um, and we we were – our weakness was we had trouble scoring points against good defensive teams. Mm. Uh, we were a good defensive team uh, – we, we like to turn you over. We average, I think, over 20 turnovers a game for the whole season. Uh, we created a lot of our offense because of our defense. And history says that playoffs don't have a lot of turnover basketball because you know each other really well. You stay away from the double teams that you don't want to be a part of. And so we were worried a little bit about our offense, but we were also worried about – their energy because they were, we were a very quick and athletic team and we liked to run up and down, but they could match us in running up and down the court. They weren't going to slow the game down like a lot of teams did against us. So our worry was that my recollection was the game one was actually a fairly easy win for us. And I think that's what hurt us mm. uh, because we thought we were going to be able to walk through this thing. And my, my team was, even though it wasn't young, it was immature in many ways. We were, at times we were too emotional. At times we got into little silly basketball, you know, conflicts. Mm. Uh, and it might've been me a little bit because Gary and I got, Gary and I were a love hate relationship. <laughs> uh, I mean, when we, when we played well, we loved each other. And when we, didn't play well. I blamed him and he blamed me. And, uh, and negative energy sometimes can destroy a basketball team or destroy any type of team. And, uh, and in one way or another, we respected Denver. Uh, as a coach, we were hoping to make it a quick series. Uh, but when we lost game three, we knew we were in for a battle. I, I know we knew we, had, we knew we had to win one more. And we knew it was going to be hard winning one more. Well, I want to go game by game here, but I I first want to get the scattering report. So, all right, big team, defensive-minded. That was kind of the the young, enthusiastic, nothing to lose maybe. Fonz, from your perspective, what was the emphasis going into that series? What were you guys trying to stop that the Sonics did well? 
Yeah, it was what Coach Carl said is uh, we were concerned about their ability to turn us over. So okay. coming into that series, we <laughs> number one on the chalkboard, right. take care of the basketball. <laughs> and so uh, th that was a huge point of emphasis for us. We did not take care of the basketball well in game one, if I remember correctly, which, you know, you, you talk about great places to play. And, and I know there's many other arenas out there, uh, the Delta Center in Utah during that time that has great fans. But I can't think outside of the Delta Center, I can't think of a place or an arena that we played in that was louder <laughs> than the Dome. And, uh, man, I love playing at Key Arena. And uh, they were charged up. And so the more they turned us over, the more frenzied the game began, the more it was in their hands because their, their right. fans were responding to every positive thing that they did. And we Snowballed. just – And they built momentum. Snowball effect. And, uh, yeah, they blew us out. I think they beat us by 20 in that first game. So coming back in the second game, uh, now that we – remember, we were young and inexperienced, so we had never been in that position before. So they had two advantages on us, a great defense that can turn you over and, and terrific finishers in transition, uh, but then also the inexperience on our part. Uh, but we had learned throughout the year that we were pretty quick learners. And sometimes when you are young, ignorance is bliss. And so uh, we weren't intimidated by the fact that we had just lost by 20. So we come into the second game, if I recall uh, correctly, is I think we lose that one by 10. Yeah. But in our minds, we felt that uh, we gave a few possessions away. And then uh, understanding that the best team should win on their home floor. Right. And so we gone home down two, but knowing that we're pretty doggone good in, in Denver, we, we take advantage of the altitude by getting out and running uh, against teams on every position, position that we can get, whether it misses or makes. And uh, we had a lot of confidence going back on our home floor. And as a side note, I do remember uh, the tunnel that we would leave out of uh, uh, and George, obviously no, no blemish on, on, on you guys or anything, but the fans are just nasty. We're <laughs> leaving that cussing us out and saying all kind of rude things to us. And, and I do remember Bison Dele and I would always leave the floor to say, oh, Brian Williams and he and I would always leave the floor together. And I remember looking up with, at them and I can't remember if game five was a Sunday or not, but I remember turning back at them because they were just being so rude going, I'll see you guys, whatever the, the day the uh, fifth game was going to be. And, uh, and so we returned home to a place that we were very comfortable in a loud arena with John Elway, of course, leading John the charge to, uh, to, yeah. to get the game started. And uh, yeah, we were pretty comfortable going back and confident going back in our home floor, even though we were down two. I want to get to game three in a moment, coach, but that it, when I'm looking and reading the stories, you know, that were written about that, uh, those first two games, it did sound like game number one, just a, a, a pretty much a blowout. You guys were in control. Did you feel like with the way game two went that, okay, this is a team that has kind of settled down and figured out, was there a sense of a momentum shift between, you know, after game two? Uh, I, the one thing my recollection is, and again, that's a long time ago for me, but, my recollection was I didn't think they played like a young team. Mm. I thought they played with more in basketball IQ than I thought they did when I started the series. You know, I, you know, I don't know who it was. I Brian Stith and, and Lafonso and, and Matumbo. They all were, as he, as Lafonso has mentioned, they weren't intimidated by the moment. Right. And our guys, you know, again, at times I thought my team was immature, and going up 2-0, I think we went to Denver in a kind of an arrogant way rather than a cocky way. And my recollection is we flew to Denver and we came back and then went back. I'm not really sure of that because I think was there a separation between the two games. That might have been another series, but there was just a lot of bad energy around the series. It was circling around us. And it kind of blew up on us as the series went on. I, I think it was after game four, Ricky Pierce and Gary Payton went after each other in the locker room. Wow. I mean, it was an ugly, ugly scene. I mean, a lot of things were said in that. I think that was a Friday afternoon, and we had to calm it down Saturday because we played Saturday, Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. and uh, And we actually played pretty well early in Denver. 
Yeah. I mean, I mean, played pretty well early in the fifth game. But as the game went on, I felt they were taking control of the game. Now, they got some great performances from some great, some players that shot the hell out of us. Right. People don't know that Robert Pack, I think, yep. made, made three or four threes in game five. It was a great game for him. He made like four or five for the whole season. And Robert and Brian Williams. Great game from him. You have too. to understand, fans, that in the history of the NBA, not many guys have ever had a 2020 mm -hmm. in a playoff game. Mm -hmm. And Brian Williams had a 2020 mm -hmm. against us in game five. And Robert Pack was the best player on the court yep. in the third quarter of game five. And, uh, you know, they got the Matumbo controlled Sean at a pretty good level. Yeah. Yep. What happened is Robert Pack got into Gary Payton's head a little bit. Interesting. And I, I'm not saying they played badly or they're at fault for losing the game. But our two studs didn't play like studs. Yeah. They just played like good players. Mm -hmm. Fonz, what, what, what do you remember that happened in that game that led to the, the win? Game, game, game three. Five. Game, game five. five. We're, we're game five here. Yeah. Uh, upon enter, well, <laughs> a backstory was that. And thank you for that detail, Coach. That you that you guys are going back because what happened is uh, it had gotten back to us that uh, that Seattle was kind of comfortable and confident that they're going to win game three. That they didn't even bring a change of clothes. Right. Oh and again, wow. Again, being young and 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 ignorant, we're kind of ticked about that, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so. And so there's all this chalkboard material that had been mounting the entire time. And if you, if you go back and, and, and look at that second season uh, of mine, when we were at our best, Reggie Williams was making shots. And I can't remember how many he had, but if Reggie Williams didn't have 30 in game three, he had to be doggone pretty close. And when Reggie Williams has got it, got it going, now it opens up everything on the yeah. interior for us to be able to go to work, right? So we win game, game three. Uh, I had a, it was my birthday. I had a big game in game four. And then we go back to game five. And it's interesting because you're always kind of looking for little competitive advantages as a player and I'm sure as a coach. But when we walked out, on the, I just talked about how rabid uh, that place had been. Uh, walked out on the floor and it was quiet. And I remember looking at uh, well Brian Williams, and I go, "Big, we got them, right?" <laughs> and, 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 and you could just sense it. And then, yeah. and, and as the game Nervous is going energy. on, to Coach Carl's point, we I could visibly see guys bickering with each other as like, Coach, you don't know this, but I always thought you had the coolest time out call ever. <laughs> and so as I've coached kids, I've done the same. So most coaches, if their things aren't going that way and they kind of tick, you know, they kind of go yelling yeah. at the referee call time out. Coach was always cool, calm, and collected and just walked in. I, I, I wish I could stand up, but I'll go out of it. So I'll try to, he would just kind of go, <laughs> the <call. laughs> yeah. so, momentum, yes. yeah. so momentum is going our way coach calmly calls the timeout and and i'm looking over at the side and and i can't remember who they were at the time kendall may kendall gill may have been one but i can see them bickering right and so yeah. now what i experienced when we walked out on the floor which is a quiet with regard to the fans and now in fighting that put that that's that's never good for winning and uh yeah, to Coach's point earlier, we had some guys that had some huge, huge performances. He mentioned Bison, well, Brian Williams and Robert Pack. Uh, B. Stiff made some big shots for us at, 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 at big times. And uh, I and we talked about earlier Dan Issel's feel for the game and the ability to make adjustments. I thought I thought the move that won that series for us when Dan decided to put Matumbo on Sean Kemp. There was something about, and Sean just going in here. I mean, he's, he's, he's a Midwestern kid. I actually lived uh, a town over from where he grew up. Oh, and, wow. Uh, Sean was amazing. 6'11. George, for his time, 6'11, 240 pounds, could run like a deer. Yeah. Jump out of the gym. Yeah. And, and <laughs> jump out the gym. He could finish with either hand. He could knock down a perimeter. J.E. added the corner three to his game. Tremendous, right? But there was something about, putting Dikembe on him that got in his head and bothered him. Sean would usually get into the painted area and he's trying to punch it on you. Against Dikembe, he's flipping it up, flipping it up. And I'm like, wow. 
So, so that was the key matchup for that entire series. For and and that that change by Dan Essel put us in position to be able to win that series. But what an incredible game on the road. When, when did that change I, come? I, I, I'm I'm sure sure. That, go ahead, the coach. Alfonso should get the recognition that he had the the guy that had the best overtime. The game five went overtime. Yep. And uh, LaFonso Ellis was the best player on the court in game five in the overtime. The matchup, when, I, when you're playing a five-game series and it goes overtime and, and you're going to matchups that you think are going to work. And we were kind of tied because we, we had, you know, Kemp and Payton were our key guys. And Detlef was – I thought Detlef had a good series but was yeah. not playing great in that series. And I actually think, LaFonso, you were going against that a lot in, in the overtime series. That's a, a great player. I love him dearly, but he wasn't a great defender. Thanks, Coach. And to go back to that point, so one of the things that happened in that game five, the Nuggets out-rebound the Sonics 58-36, to a dominant rebounding. And you talked about uh, Brian Williams playing alongside Dikembe for a majority of that fourth quarter. I think you actually – missed the first 10 and a half minutes of the fourth quarter you weren't in the game mm -hmm. bring you in with the last minute 30 something like that and you knock down a shot at regulation a shot in the in the overtime what do you recall about about that because it's not very often that a guy comes in and hits arguably the two biggest shots of the game after not playing for a majority of the fourth yeah if i recall i think i picked up a fourth foul um mm. somewhere in the third quarter so it sat for a while uh but again <laughs> given the interchangeability of the pieces that we had. You know, I'm just kind of cheering for my teammates over there and trying to add value in the timeouts, uh, things that they may not see because they're out there on the floor. And uh, I was actually surprised, having sat over there for so long, that Dan decided to put me back in the game. Right, yeah. And um, – I yeah, wish he wouldn't have. Say it again, Coach. I wish he wouldn't have put you back in the game. <laughs> yeah, the um, – I was, um, you know, it, if you wake me up in the middle of the night, I, I love the left block, uh, turn around, jump from my right shoulder yeah. or hook shot into the middle uh, with my right hand. And uh, it's all about matchups. And uh, I can't remember the one in regulation, but uh, one, I ended up with Gary Payton on me. And uh, I remember time running down. And at that point, you got, you, you got to try to make a shot. And so I just kind of elevated over my right shoulder and by the grace of God, able to knock it down. And uh, yeah, gave us some momentum going into going, getting ready to go into overtime. But the thing I remember is you talked about the rebounding part. Um, we didn't block out. And yep. the field comes out of nowhere, tips that bad boy in. <laughs> Should have won in regulation. Yeah. 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 And so um, I, I do think the, the, the poise that our group showed being as young as we were, was kind of forged over the entire rookie year of ours with an opportunity to be able to get to the uh, playoffs, but just missing uh, to the clips. And then a full year, because remember, I, I think at All-Star break, were we 20 and 30? I think something like that. Yeah, it was another year that needed a push, a late mm -hmm. season push. And then we went on a great run. And so uh, in terms of experience, we were young and so inexperienced at that level. But in terms of uh, adversity, I felt we were pr pretty grizzled. And I think that showed up in that fifth game. What was it like in the immediate moments after that? I mean, we obviously know the iconic Dikembe Mutombo falling down and embracing the ball. But what do you remember about the final buzzer and, and just sort of the fallout from that, that moment? Yeah, I remember, uh, well, my wife and many of the wives were up in the stands there. So I remember kind of giving them one of those and hugging my teammates, Brian Williams and I, as usual, walking off the floor. And, and I'm so proud of him because he was dominant. I mean, dominant. And uh, getting back into the, it, it was almost, it was almost surreal in the sense because we had, I know individually had so much respect uh, for, for the Supersonics and the talent that they had. I mean, Nate McMillan, Gary Payton, Detlef Shrimp, Sean Kemp, yeah. uh, uh, on and on, right? Loaded. And uh, Bob, Kloppen, Bob Kloppenberg, one of the great defensive gurus in the history of our game, Coach Carl, I mean, with his style, unique, and yet, uh, you know, gets you back on your heels. And, and so... I don't think it was until many years later that I got a chance to kind of think about it for a moment, what that young team was able to accomplish. And uh, 
unfortunately, injuries and trades uh, right. over the next couple of years uh, kept us from being able to capitalize on that momentum. But for that point and that moment in time, having had a chance to win a series over a great coach that had put together some elite players uh, was significant uh, and the most significant part of my career for sure. Coach, on your end, you know, the, the Sonics were good for several years, and, including all the way up and through 1996. But that year, you know, did it feel at the time when you when you lose that game, did you feel this was our best opportunity? Things are going to change. And in what ways did the team change following that loss? Uh, well, I think the big tra- uh, we made a big trade the next year that was really important to us. We traded Kendall Gill who never fit in with our basketball team, we traded him for Hersey Hawkins. Mm-hmm. Now, if you look at that trade, Kendall's a better talent. Yes. He's bigger, stronger, more athletic than Hersey. But Hersey fit our team. Mm-hmm. And it kind of it gave us a new spirit and new energy. And we would go on to get to the NBA Finals, I think, the next year or the year after. And then have another good three or four good years. But... We made a trade, and uh, and then people don't remember the next year. We went down to uh, we played all our games on the road because they tore up Key Arena. That's right. Mm. That's right. And we played in Tacoma the next year, and we got beaten the first round by by the L.A. Lakers, a good L.A. Lakers team. And so everybody had me fired. Everybody had me fired, but some reason, some while, I survived and. And uh, maybe we made that Hersey Hawkins trade that year. Hmm. And that, 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 that was the year we go on to the NBA Finals. Yeah. Okay. Um, Fonz, we're going to – two years we missed against these guys in Tacoma were the two years Michael was playing baseball. <laughs> <laughs> well, we kept going, oh, my God, if we would have gotten to the Finals one of those other two years, that probably would have been better for us. That's right. It's crazy what a difference. I mean, we just saw it last year with Toronto playing in Tampa Bay. I mean, that's such an underrated thing. You're not in your home stadium. It's just, it's completely different. You lose all that advantage. But um, I want to move on. We, we've only got a couple minutes here, Fonz, but I kind of want to race through the rest of the, the your time here in Denver. You know, that next summer you get hurt during the summer. This is a team, again, that just had a 1-8 upset, first time in NBA history, came back from two games to zero. And actually came back in the following series against Utah after getting down and continued to, to look great. By all accounts, a team on the rise. The next year was a snake fit year. You get hurt. You miss almost the entire season. Robert Pack gets hurt twice during that season and ends up falling out. Do you remember at the time? First of all, take me to the injury. Who did who did you tell? Did you know right away this is this is major? This is something big. And and how did you let people know? Because it happened in the offseason. Yeah, Brian Steth and I were working out, just going to play some pickup games, and I landed, not even awkwardly, but uh, the way I landed, I thought I hyperextended my knee. Mm. And my wife has a training background, so I went home, had her check it out, and no ACL, no MCL, no patella tendon, nothing like that. So within days, we get x-rays, and we find out I have these degenerative cysts, basically with their small kind of microscopic holes in my kneecaps that we know weren't there uh, prior to because that season was over. Uh, we had some x-rays on file. And um, so that kind of started the madness. Um, had to have sur- uh, groundbreaking surgery uh, on it. Uh, and then three months later, I can kind of feel something going on in my left knee. So I ended up having surgery on my left knee and my right knee at that time because yeah. the right knee wasn't healing properly. And so, yeah, so that, that um, you know, you, you have these highs and lows in life and certainly those highs and lows in, 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 in a career. And so we go from a high, high of having done what we accomplished, becoming the first number eight seed to be the number one seed to the low, low of having a uh, having a an injury that no medical doctors had ever seen before in an athlete and having to go through a four year missing that. And, and the downside of that, the hardest part is sitting on the sideline and not being able to go to war with your teammates. Right. And so uh, mentally, that was the most challenging year of my career. And, you know, it was also a mentally challenging year for Dan Issel. That was a year that 30 games into the season, he ends up stepping down. And a, a, a quote he had was that he didn't like the person he was becoming as a coach. And, mm-hmm. you know, Coach Carl, I want to kind of throw this to you. I see Michael Malone. I, I go to practices. I'm always following. My number one takeaway from being kind of seeing behind the curtain is I think, 
the amount of stress an NBA coach go, is under at all times, this, the amount of different things and the pressures. And, you know, I have to imagine that's one of the biggest challenges is how do you manage that much stress every day and not allow it to change who you are as a person? This, you know, can you speak to, to the challenge that that gives you? Uh, I think it's a good point. I think NBA, I've told, uh, when I, I, everybody asks me, is it fun being an NBA coach? It's not fun being an NBA coach. Um, it's hard. It's a hard job, a difficult job. And, um, you know, you do it to, uh, when you're trying to always exceed expectations. It becomes an ugly job in a lot of ways. And I think beating us puts some expectations on the Nuggets. They played very well in that the, the next series against Utah, they're down 3-0 and come back and take it to a game seven. That was a hell of a series. And they, they had the whole NBA going, whoa, these guys are coming. They're coming fast. And then, of course, injuries and trades and whatever. Expectations get a high, get ahead of who you really are. And the coach gets blamed for that. Failures go on the coach's head. Hmm. And, and the NBA has got uh, – the. I remember early in my career when I coached in the 80s and 90s, there was more joy to winning mm -hmm. than there is today. Interesting. Why? I'm, really I don't interesting. Want, I'm not a sociologist. I'm not sure. But all I know is winning just puts off, procrastinates losing. Instead of joy and celebration when we win, we just go, well, we don't have to worry about losing today. Interesting. And I, I, even back in the 90s, I think coaches got worn out by the stress. And today, it's worse. It's worse than ever. And the truth of the matter is, that's part of the job right now. It's not going to change. Uh, we get pay, you know, Coaches get paid a lot of money, yeah. and expectations aren't going to go away. Mm -hmm. Fonz, did, was there a moment where you felt like the era was over? Because you go the next season, you miss pretty much all of it. You come back with five games left. In fact, every, all three seasons, the playoffs were came down to the wire. In fact, I think in the 95 season, you come back with five five games, something like that left. You're only playing four or five minutes a game at that point as you're coming back from injury. But the Nuggets have to go 3-0 and down the stretch to make the playoffs, and they do, including an overtime win. Yeah. Last, last game of the season is against the Kings. It's Whoever wins that one gets to go into the playoffs, and Nuggets win that one, I think, by two points. Um, but and, and then you know, couldn't capture that same playoff magic in '96. You draft uh Antonio McDyess, <laughs> you have the Mahmoud uh anthem situation. And was there a moment in any of this that you felt like uh, the windows may be closing on this this era, this group that you have? Uh, yes, and part of that is, and, and, and coach, you can speak to it better than I because you, you, you play, you're a player and you coach for a long time. But and, and sometimes there's something special happens and that, that and that special quality is defined by the group that you have. You talk, you heard coach talk about uh, the addition of Hersey Hawkins. Right. And I got to know Hersey pretty well. I mean, he's a, pro, the, a pro's pro could shoot it, <laughs> could defend. And he's the perfect solution for that team. What made us so good was not necessarily <laughs> What made us so good was the individual parts, and we had a, an incredible chemistry. Uh, we had incredible versatility, and we all understood that, and we rooted for each other. If you take just one person, mm. especially out of that probably eight rotation, it changes the complexion of it completely. And so by that time, my mood's gone. Uh, we don't know if I'm going to get back healthy or not. We, we draft a great player in Antonio McDice, uh, yet that changes the chemistry. Bazendele is now gone. I think he went to the right. Clippers uh, yeah. from there. And so what was special was the group. You start to pick at the group a little bit, and now all of a sudden what made that group special in terms of the chemistry, the love for each other, the sacrifice for each other, the cheering for each other, even when you can't be out there on the floor, it changes it completely. So by the time uh, my fifth season came around where I was starting to get healthy, uh, the the – pieces that made the puzzle so great were now not there anymore. And so, yes, I knew an era was over by that time. 
The last one I want to ask you, Fonz, and I appreciate you giving us all an hour of your time to tell sure. this story. is a great, great recounting of, of some of the, the best years to be a Nuggets fan. Um, do you feel a part of the Nuggets? You know, now that we're 30 years later, do you feel like a through thread between the, the history of the Nuggets and that now you are a part of it? Or is that an area you feel the organization maybe uh, there, there's things you'd like to see them do to feel more included? Yeah, from a historical perspective, no question. And the organization has been great to me. They've invited me out twice, I think, over the last four or five years to be part of uh, celebrations that they've had. Um, obviously, I went on to play uh, five more years in Atlanta, Minneapolis, right. and finally Miami. But there's nothing like having had an opportunity to be, the nugget, be a nugget. Uh, I'll be a nugget for the rest of my life. And uh, to have an opportunity to play in front of one of the best fan bases in the entire uh, NBA in a community that wasn't sure about me when I had first come in, but within about a month or so really embraced my wife, my family and me. Uh, yeah, we had an opportunity to do something special there for a couple of years. Didn't get a chance to see it come to fruition, but uh, I've always will have a fondness for uh, the organization, a fondness for that community, and obviously for my coaches, former players, <laughs> strength and conditioning coach, <laughs> slash trainer, <laughs> slash flight attendant, you name it. And uh, yeah, so yes, uh, there, I, I have a very strong connection uh, to the Denver Nuggets. Even well, I, I love to hear that. I'm 38 years old. I, almost everybody that's my age, somewhere between 37 and, and 45. There's, it's a very short list of players when you say, okay, who are your favorite Nuggets? And it's McDice, it's Fonz, it's Mahmoud. Uh, so I, I feel so lucky that we got to spend this hour really getting to hear that that story from, from you. So thank you so much for being a part of this. When you're in Denver, you got to come down to the DNVR bar and have a, have a bite to eat and maybe a drink with the, with us. And, and I'd enjoy some of the old stories. Maybe we can get some of the other crazy chopper stories from the <laughs> <laughs> There's not a microphone in front of us. That's right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you all Thanks, for having everybody. Me. Don't forget to hit that like button on the way out and subscribe to Keeping It 1000 podcast. Oh, by the way, can you plug real quick? You, you said at the start here, you got a new podcast. I want everybody to hear about it. It's called Bald Men on Campus. I've worked for ESPN for the last, this will be my 13th season. And uh, Jay Phyllis, Seth Greenberg, and I talk all things college basketball. I'm hitting the subscribe button as soon as we get down. Everybody else do the exact, the exact same thing. And everybody will see you next week. Thanks so much. Thank you.